First of all, welcome to my presentation. And just for the people in the back who are suffering, I mean, after this summer, I'd say there is p uh, spaces left in the front and it's not quite as hot as up on the top. Okay, the topic of my presentation is the influence of lactic acid bacteria in malting and brewing. And I'm always happy to talk about uh, lactic acid bacteria, they're my favorite microbes. Just to quick introduce them, they're gram-positive. They can utilize carbohydrates and turn them into lactic acid and sometimes also a little bit of acetic acid. And if you're very lucky, even alcohol. They are very acidic tolerant, so they can survive, uh, they can live quite happily in beer, especially if they're hop resistant as well. What's very good about these organisms, and the reason we are working with them, is a lot of them are, uh, gra have a grass status, which means they're generally recommended as safe. Not all of them, but the majority of them. And what's also good about them, you find them uh, generally on most cereals and uh, vegetables and so on, as an indigenous microflora. Traditionally, they have been used for fermented food, which brings me to my next slide. One of my colleagues and good friends, Michael Gensle, in Alberta University, created the periodic table of fermented foods. And that just gives you an idea how versatile fermentation is. In all of these products, lactic acid bacteria play a very important role. It's just to give you an overview. Um, lactic acid bacteria, malting and brewing. Some of you hate them, others like them. Uh, the ones who hate them, hate them because they can cause spoilage in beer. They can cause diacetyl, they can cause slime production. In Germany, traditionally, where people worked with a Reinheitsgebot, they've been used for the production of acid malt and also the biological acidification of mash and wort. In brewing, everything which has a lower pH actually works a little bit better. Now, here in Belgium, they love their lactic acid bacteria because it's part of the brewing tradition for those very traditional beers like the lambic beers. Some people like them, others not, so it's a matter of, you know, flavor. Um, we are working with lactic acid bacteria and we are trying to use them not just as acid producers but use strains which also have additional properties which makes them even more useful, such as antimicrobial properties, production of enzymes, sensory modulation or to increase the nutritional value of the beverage. First of all, I want to talk about lactic acid bacteria and their antifungal properties. To this, I just would like to introduce fungal infection during malting. For most of you, that won't be new, but we have some lovely pictures I wanted to show off. So, Fusarium infections are quite common. They are leading to diseases such as Fusarium head blight, which lead to a lot of economic losses, uh, problems with your grain yield, but also what's most important, um, they produce mycotoxins. Mycotoxins have a multitude of health effects. They, uh, they are toxic, as the name says, but they also can have negative impact on replication of DNA in your body, for example. In the, there is restrictions how much mycotoxins you can have in your product, so it can lead to the rejection of a set of grains in a maltster's company. Now, one of my students, Pedro, who did a good bit of work on how fungal uh, infection actually changes uh, the quality of malt, and I hope now, oh yeah, here you can see we inoculated uh, barley with infected kernels, up to 20%. And then we monitored the fungal growth. And you can see your fungal growth increases four times. Then at the same time, we also measured the mycotoxin content. And the mycotoxin content, in this case it was done, uh, it went up by nine times. What we also detected was that we generated a lower extract, we got off flavors, we got premature yeast flocculation and goshing. Here are just some of the pictures uh, how 
actually fungal infection affects your ultra structure. And I have a few more here for you. So what we do, we take the caramel, we cut it, and we put it under, uh, you freeze dry it, you gold coat it, and then put it under a scanning electron microscope. So this is just the granule cut in half. This is when you look a little bit deeper. Here you look really deep, so as you see the aloyron layer. Here's spargy endosperm and how it changes during malting. What you can see there is how the cell walls who are holding in the endosperm, the granules together, is degraded slowly. These are pictures now which were done on the laser scanning electron micrograph. You can see there we can stain the various compounds. So your protein is red, your beta glucan is blue, your starch is black. And again, you can see here in the endosperm the nice cell walls which have a lot of the beta glucan but also protein inside. You can see how it changes during malting. Now what happens when I have an infection with Fusarium? Did the same thing. Uh, you can also, if you have it still in the head, you can see how your here your overall structure is much more open. It's loose. You have see much more degradation when you compare it. And you can even see as much as your Fusarium hyphae who are formed within the granules. You can see how your starch granules start degrading. You get those bite marks, which are due to the action of alpha amylase. And your fungus does produce a lot of amylases, which help with the degradation of your starch granules. And this can also be visualized then very nicely with a laser scanning microscope. What we did then, we took this uh, infected grain and we made beer from it. And what we did see was that your mycotoxins are heat stable and they're also water soluble. So what was quite shocking is that from your infected barley, about 80% ended up in your beer. Your beer quality was also in affected in other ways, like higher color, uh, but you got to better foam stability, which isn't surprising because you had a lot more peptides there. Um, now I want to introduce why am I talking about this when I'm talking about lactic acid bacteria. So we wanted to use lactic acid bacteria as a way to prevent uh, fungal growth during malting. So what did we do? We isolated lactic acid bacteria, and here we screened thousands of uh, individual co uh, lactic acid bacteria. We isolated their DNA, identified what strain it was, then we screened them in that particular case for antifungal properties. A screening medium like this looks like what you see here. These are your lactic acid bacteria. The white stuff here is your fungus growing and you see you recognize an antifungal strain because it forms a halo. But we also, we worked with a couple of very clever chemists. We were able to isolate and characterize the antifungal compounds using an array of different uh, GCMS and all these kind of things, uh, together with our bioassays, which con uh, consists of fungal spores and are they growing or not growing, that tells us if we have an antifungal compound. We then use them for processing. We are using them on the field for bioprotection as a natural bioprotectant, malting and beverages, and also uh, a lot. I, I also have a, a big group in baking technology. We're using them for shelf life extension of cereal product. For example, if you use those, you can extend your shelf life of your bread from five days to 14 days just by using a specific sourdough. Now here's just the result of these antifungal screening. You can see a lot of the strains do have a certain antifungal activity, but only very, very few have a broad spectrum. And of the thousands we had, only about 2% of the strains were actually antifungal to a broad range of uh, molds. We then carried out model stu system studies, and you can see here 
treated with nandifungal LAB here untreated. You can see how effective such a strain is. What we did then, we wanted to isolate the components. This is just one example. What we do, we take the strain, we grow it up in wort, we ferment it, we centrifuge it, we heat treat it, and then run it over um, a HPLC where we have, it took us years to develop that method, but we have it now uh, where we can look for acid-based antifungal compounds. Here's just one strain, which was a Vizella, where we found four antifungal compounds, phenylactic acid, hydrobenzoic acid, phenylactic um, fluoric acid and hydrophorylic acid. So we have one strain which we've patented, which actually produces 22 different uh, acid-based antifungal compounds. So this one only produced uh, four. What we did then, we um, produced these uh, supernatants from our lactic acid bacteria, which are antifungal, and we produced them at different strengths of word, so three degree Prato, six degree and 12 degree. And we these pre-contaminated barley caramels were then in inoculated with these cell-free supernatants of our antifungal strains. And here are the results. Um, you can see here our control, that's time zero. So very little. And then in the one which wasn't treated with cell-free supernatant, you see a massive increase in fungal growth. The stars here is your mycotoxin content. And when we had um, a wort which had a very low degree of plateau, so not that much density, that actually um, worked the best for us. This is part of the thesis of Pedro Oliveira who is now not working, he's now working in industry. Now, so what we could prove here was that by using lactic acid bacteria which have antifungal properties or the seal-free supernatant, we could reduce the fungal growth significantly as well as the production of mycotoxins. Now I want to come to the next topic where we are using specific lactic acid bacteria to reduce malting loss. Uh, during malting, a certain amount of our grain um, or our malt is lo lost through rootlets. And this can be up to about 4 to 10% of your malt. And what we did, we screened again a lot of different strains and we found some which we are not quite sure what they're producing, but they're producing substances which allow us to inhibit rootlet growth. Here, for example, here is your barley, um, treated with different, it's, in this case it's a lactobacillus plantarum, and also lactic acid as a control. And you can see here, this is your normal barley after five days of germination, nice rootlet growth, where here we have the lactic acid bacteria treated sample, which has about 50 to 70% less rootlet growth. So that's all lovely, but does that really mean you can use it for brewing or is the malt quality so bad that you <laughs> can't use it anymore? So obviously we did a malt analysis and you can see that the malt, we get a small reduction in the, in the production of enzymes like alpha and beta amylase. But things like friability, nitrogen, is not affected by the treatment with these specific lactic acid bacteria. We also made beer from it, and here are just some of the um, mesh results. What we did find, there was no difference in pH, extract color, FAN, a little bit of a difference in the fermentability to the control. Uh, but overall, we could compensate for this by just having a little bit of a longer alpha amylase stand. So by just changing slightly your mesh conditions, you were able to, com to compensate for that small difference. So next is, um, we are also using lactic acid bacteria to uh, produce alternative 
beverages or novel beverages. In Ireland, it's no different to anywhere else. We can't get funding neither from the EU nor from our government for alcohol beer-related research. So you have, to get your keep your research group going, you have to be a bit inventive. So we have been working for quite a long time now on these word-based beverages. And the market for these type of beverages is growing. The consumer is more health conscious. Uh, they're a bit tired of drinking Coca-Cola and Fanta all the time. Uh, I mean, when we think of Coca-Cola, you can clean your house with it. It can't be that healthy. And I think the consumer is actually copying on to that as well. So these word-based beverages have been uh, growing have been becoming more popular. And funny-wise, the country where they are most popular is not the Middle East, it's actually in, in China. So what do we do? Uh, we And every brewer can kind of do that. You take your barley malt, you produce a wort. We actually don't use a 12 degree plateau, we use only a six degree plateau. Then we are using usually strains which can do a bit more than just producing lactic acid. These strains, now three of them, actually are antifungal producers, so they also give you an extended shelf life. The Vaisella gibaria is a strain which produces so-called exopolysaccharides. Um, you're probably afraid of those because they produce slime in your brewery, but here for this, they actually give you a lovely mouthfeel uh, in your product. Uh, we ferment them at 30 to 37 degrees, we filter, we carbonate, and then uh, we characterize them. And here's just some of the results. Uh, wort is a great medium. It's actually much better than milk for growing bacteria like that. You get an increase in your cell numbers for up to 10 to the power of 10, which is enormous. But at the same time, I'm not sure how they support their growth. Your extract level goes down very little, only by 0.5 degree plateau. Your FAN level goes up by 20%, but not a lot. And depending on what strains you use, do you use a homofermentative or a heterofermentative one, you can get different flavor profiles uh, by just changing your lactate and acetate uh, amount. So you get a more pungent flavor if you have more acetate, obviously, and a more mellow flavor when you have more lactate. What we have done then uh, with Professor Jakob and um, Martin Sanko was flavor analysis in Wein Stefan. They have a great team tasting. For me to get such a good sensory evaluation, I would have to train a long time. So anyway, we used their sensory team and their flavor analysis to understand the flavor changes taking place in such a word-based beverage. When we start off, we all know what word taste is, sweet, malty. When you ferment it with lactic acid bacteria, you actually change the flavor profile totally. And you can get any flavor you want, depending on the strain. We did recently a large study with, I don't know, 50 of our strains. I have a bank of about 1,000 strains. So, and we could get any flavor from wet socks, which obviously wasn't a good one, up to lemon flavor apple flavor. Um, so generally what happens when you want to generalize it is that the Strecker aldehydes are reduced during the uh, lactic acid fermentation and the products like diacetyl, acetoin, al all the acid aldehydes are increasing, which lead to a quite a, a fruity flavor. Now I come to something I'm not sure even if I should talk about that here. Um, it is something of the future. And I want to say, I don't want the brewers to take this particular strain now. It's something to prove a concept. OK, we've started to work with our department in microbiology in Trinity, which are microbiologists and geneticists. They love GMOs. OK, I know in brewing we don't love them so much yet. And we wanted to just see what is possible. So there are so-called natural peptides or defensins there. You have them everywhere. 
We have them in our body. Uh, you have them in plants. Um, they're small little proteins, but they're extremely effective. Nowadays, the consumer wants to go away, when we look at preservation, wants to go away from chemical preservatives. They want natural. So fermented foods, small natural peptides, extracts of plants, this kind of stuff. So here we, we looked at defensins. As I said, they're small little proteins. The one we picked out first, and that's because we are just, was um, a defense in a better defense in coming from humans. Um, it has been reported to be highly antimicrobial. We then checked it against all our array of bad bacteria, bad molds, and we find that that stuff is really powerful. I mean, we made recently a bread with it. You ju it just doesn't, doesn't go off at all, at all. Um, so they're extremely powerful antimicrobial agents. So what did we do? We cloned these, or the gene which codes for the beta defensin, which is a small protein, only 45 amino acids big, into a beer yeast. And we then made beer with it. It grows a bit slower than its parent. And then we inoculated, now we come to the spoilers, the ones you don't want. We inoculated with beer spoilers. You have that problem sometimes during fermentation. And they kept them down really nicely. What did we do next? We took the beer we had produced and we put it in bottles and we put more spoilers inside. And again, we could see that the better defense in who is heat stable would kill off those and you had no shelf life problems. So don't get me wrong, I don't want to use strains of saccharomyces which are genetically modified to turn into little killers to be left in the open. But for us, it was uh, showing the principle behind it, showing the possibility of these type of uh, molecules and what they can do for the future. I wouldn't take a human defense and if it was by choice, I would take something else. But for us, this is a great tool now where we can go further to you for more natural defenses which can have uh, their potential in the food industry. And we have already found quite a few of them. Um, so in conclusion, lactic acid bacteria are wonderful organisms and I hope you can understand why I love those little fellows. Um, they can have antifungal activity, combat fusarium, mycotoxin production. They can help you with your malting loss. They can create you lovely new beverages. And they can also uh, be combated by using novel technologies. So last but not least, I want to thank the people who actually did the work. It's always like that. As a professor, you never do anything yourself. You have all the other people doing it. There is Alex Mauch, who worked on the um, malt, uh, malting loss. Pedro Oliveira worked on the antifungal. Lorenzo Perrier on the uh, beverages. Thibaut Terry on the GMO. And then we're working together with wonderful chemists in Korg Institute of Technology, Ambrose Fury Breed, Brosnan and Aiden Coffey. In TU Munich, I would like to thank Fritz Jakob and Martin Zanko, who always help us when it comes to flavor. And then Ursula Bond in Trinity, who did the constructs. Last but not least, I want to thank Funding, the Irish government, for the little bit they gave us. But my Big thanks goes actually to AB InBev. AB InBev has been extremely good to me over the years. They have been funding fellowships where I could publish everything. Um, and my own brewing group would not be in existence without the help of AB InBev. So just as one way of how industry can actually support uh, research as well. So thank you very much for your attention. We got a question over here. 
Hi, I'm Sophie Sarens from uh, Christian Hansen, uh, Denmark. I would like to, uh, first of all, thanks for the wonderful talk. I just have uh, one question. Uh, I think it's very interesting what you say that you can do uh, a lot with like the acid bacteria and also for uh, new beverages. I was just wondering, you showed uh, in the one slide that they actually only eat eat half a degree Plato. Why is that? If they do eat maltose, there is much more maltose still in the, in the world. So what is stopping them from fermenting any further? I think they actually inhibit themselves. I mean, you saw that I got up to 10 to the power of 10, and they can't grow any further. Uh, we could also just get away with a, with a much dilute wort, and we'd get the same result. They just don't need that much. OK, thanks. I have a question about uh, defensins. Are they uh, comparable to the bactericins like nisin? No, they're nothing like that. Um, but, uh, defensins are actually much more potent. I mean, when you think of bactericins, they only work against the same species. You know, if you have a, la uh, a lactosin or something, it only works against bacteria. Where the defensins, they can work against fungi, yeast, against anything really. Okay, thank you. So another question on defensins. Hi. Um, did you introduce an uh, inducible promoter for these constructs, or were they constitutive? And also, um, how stable is the molecule in the sense that can you make an extract and use it um, against like the acid bacteria, or does it actually have to be produced in the medium by the yeast? Uh, you can make an extract. That's not a problem. Uh, there is a promoter in front of it, and since then, I mean, I'm not a geneticist, um, but Ursula was telling me that they have now, um, I think, 10 or 20 times increased the pro production of the defense and by just putting multiple promoters in front of it. So it can be done, and it is extremely stable.